Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Conversations with Tyler. Today, I am here with Daniel Carpenter. He is one of the world's leading experts on regulation. He is perhaps the leading academic expert on the FDA. He has a new book coming out this May called Democracy by Petition, Popular Politics and Transformation, 1790 to 1870, and he is in the Department of Government at Harvard University. Daniel, welcome. Thanks for having me, Tyler. Now, we will get to the AstraZeneca vaccine, but first let me ask about a few other topics. The Pendleton Civil Service Act of 1883, right? The goal was to replace hires by patronage with hires by merit. How should we be changing that act today? Oh, good question. Uh, I think I would um, begin by saying that um, I'm not sure we need examinations, which by the way, still exist in many areas of the civil service, uh, that we should have perhaps uh, minimum criteria, but the criteria should not be reduced to say a four-year college degree. Um, I do believe that uh, the Pendleton Act uh, created uh, the basis for um, the decline of patronage, uh, and it took a while. Um, the Pendleton Act depended heavily upon presidential enforcement, and it was actually Theodore Roosevelt, two decades after the act, more than two decades after the act, who really uh, implemented the pivotal administrative decisions there. Um, but I would say if we were trying to do this today, I would actually reduce the number of political appointees at the top levels of the civil service. Um, it's actually relevant to some recent uh, politics regarding the FDA. Um, uh, surely the leaders of an administrative agency, uh, executive branch or so-called independent commission are appointed by the president. That's an article two power. Uh, they should continue to be appointed by the president. It's all of the other folks, uh, communications, undersecretaries, and so forth, uh, that I think, um, I'm not sure about the added value of those appointments, and I think we would do better by restricting their number. But the regular appointees, say the G14s, just people in the agency, how should the standards for their hiring and firing be different? Or are we at some kind of actual optimum? Oh, no, I don't think we're anywhere uh, near an actual optimum. I think it's worth pointing out, by the way, um, uh, that, um, you know, the, the federal civil service, which we're talking about here, um, is quite different from uh, the state and local level civil service. One of the things that merit reform did is it it got rid of one form of politics by uh, you know, reducing the link between partisanship, party organization, and uh, appointment at the, at the you know, middle and lowest levels. But it introduced another. Um, it accentuated and facilitated uh, the growth of employee, public employee labor unions. Um, and I have a mixed judgment on those. Um, I, I don't think you can have a conversation about policing like we're having in this country right now um, uh, without uh, calling into question uh, the value of some of those unions and the degree to which they protect their members from uh, egregious uh, uh, actions. Um, obviously, there's a huge literature there as well on um, uh, 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 teachers unions and other public employees unions. At the federal level, I actually think the federal employee unions are pretty weak. Um, and part of that is just basic political science. Um, just about nowhere other than a few Western states. Um, and, you know, I guess you'd probably say uh, parts of Virginia now are federal employee unions politically strong enough to make a difference in the kind of electoral calculations of a congressional majority. Um, so I don't know that we've reached an optimum there. Um, I do think um, uh, termination uh, uh, at some level should be easier uh, for basic non-performance. Um, I, I do think uh, using career incentives uh, among a whole bunch of um, uh, uh, positions in the civil service uh, should be easier to do. 
Um, but I would say at the federal level, you've got a situation where, again, I'm not going to say optimum. Um, if anything, I believe the last presidential administration showed us the value of having an independent civil service, one that cannot be used by um, uh, you know, a, a party or a leader who verges on authoritarian energies. Um, while at the same time avoiding some of the problems that one sees in the worst case of public employee union abuses, uh, such as we see in some police departments. If one studies the history of postal supply and regulation, as you have done, postal <laughs> supply, what lessons can we learn about regulating the internet today? Oh, goodness. Because Good the question. postal service was a kind of early internet, right? Remarkably cheap and fast by the standards of its time. Everyone had a voice. It was hard to censor. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, look, there, there are whole sorts of folks you could talk to about you know, net neutrality and its value. I, I, I would say that, that you know, our political culture in the history of the United States um, and much of our economy uh, and much of our education system presumed an open access, I mean, minimal cost for sending letters with all these cross subsidies. So the letters subsidized the newspapers, which was crucial because the newspapers kind of created a much more informed society. Um, it was a platform for advertising, things like that. So um, I don't want to go, I don't want to make a simplistic mapping from that to say net neutrality, because there are a whole bunch of other issues uh, involved there. But I do think uh, the degree to which um, providers can close off access uh, or make access to uh, this, this large uh, externality um, much more costly is, um, is a grave concern. And for what it's worth, at some level, yes, we're, we're there with the internet now, and at some level it's replaced the post office. But as I recently argued in the Boston Review, not entirely. Um, there are still uh, a large number of uh, magazines, uh, newspaper subscriptions, uh, for that matter now, uh, uh, you know, pharmacy activities and others that rely heavily upon the postal system and probably will for the foreseeable future. In the 19th century, how was the Postal Service central to the progressive reform movement? Um, I think it was seen as the um, both the um, exemplar of what a potentially open access uh, public uh, public service could be in a way that nobody had really thought about any other um, function of the federal government being so universal. I mean, even consider the army, which we would today say is, okay, how can you define a state without its military and its army? But as we know, not really until the progressive era was the United States army unified and the civil war was fought through militias. Um, any number of other services uh, were of course decentralized to the state level, sometimes to the local. And so progressive saw at, at one moment in the uh, postal service um, well, here's actually something that the national government can do, and it can provide this platform, this platform for, you know, a democratic republic, open deliberation, markets, uh, and um, a much more um, universalized cultural dialogue. Uh, I don't want to say singular cultural dialogue, you know, uh, pluralism was there, um, but a much more uh, uh, globalized uh, dialogue. That said, I think the other thing they saw in the Postal Service, and this is something that Theodore Roosevelt saw in the Postal Service, was something that was being eaten from within by the patronage system. Uh, and it was in part uh, the folks in the Pendleton Act, but I would argue even more the presidents who kind of really pushed civil service reform forward with their administrative decisions, who said, if it's gonna happen anywhere, it has to happen in the Postal Service, in part because uh, there's a big part of our economy as well as our society that depends upon it. And Roosevelt, uh, before and after, uh, he made these very controversial moves to cover in, as it said, thousands of postmaster positions under the merit system, actually received a lot of support from shipping in industries uh, and um, sort of medium size, smaller size uh, retailers. <laughs>
If we just outright privatized the entire postal system in America today, what is the most significant change that would result? I think you'd be cutting off um, vast sections. I mean, truly privatized without a universal service standard, right? Correct. So we're no not, price we're not regulation. Doing, yeah, we're not doing nothing. Ma Bell. You know, we're not doing truly privatize, I think basically you would accentuate and and accelerate um, the uh, bi-coastal concentration of culture, uh, 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 wealth, talent, um, and economic uh, innovation uh, in the United States. That may be- Isn't that a good a thing though, right? To induce people to move to higher productivity regions? Uh, agreed. Um, I think uh, there's all sorts of reasons to to think that, you know, depopulation of some rural areas uh, might be uh, potentially a good thing. Um, but I also think that there are ways to do that. Uh, we certainly have, you know, lots of those pressures right now. Um, and there are also, I think, ways to do that that um, still I mean, the, the concern I have is that, you know, you're cutting off a, a vast number, I mean, tens of millions of people um, from a part of their culture, again, that they still use. But those um, people can use Federal Express today, right? Or UPS. Yeah, but I don't think that's going to be, at least not until we get different models, I don't think that's going to be a viable model for Express Scripts. I mean, Express Scripts uses the postal system for good reason. They don't use Federal Express. What kinds of records should the Postal Service keep about itself? <laughs> uh, great question. Um, well, there's, uh, you know, there's a whole set of things that they don't since the Griswold decision and since the uh, kind of, you know, First Amendment decisions, they don't keep as much, uh, they don't keep as much records of, of kind of uh, what goes through uh, the mail. They can't prohibit things like pornography, contraception. Um, I think, you know, well, I, I guess it depends on what you mean by itself. I, I would start uh, with the idea that I think basic privacy restrictions, which governed the postal system as much through norm as by law in the 19th century and early 20th century um, should govern the system. So, you know, it's a crime. If, if I were to walk past your mailbox and open your letter, I'm, I'm committing a federal crime. Uh, uh, but there were also norms that, uh, you know, the seals were not to be broken, things like that. So I do think um, whichever way the Postal Service goes, and it's quite possible that you could imagine an electronic platform uh, for the U.S. postal system, um, I think basic privacy restrictions uh, have to be uh, guaranteed. I also think, um, actually, in some respects, I think we need to know a fair amount about what postal workers do uh, without, say, calling for Amazon-like tracking, but if we think that postal workers are misplacing ballots, are uh, you know not providing uh, birth control pills or something like that, then you know we should probably have some way of picking up on that kind of uh, nefarious behavior. If we consider regulation in general at the state and local level, should we think of that as simply a one-way ratchet? that basically just goes up over time and hardly ever goes down and eventually gets to be too complex, too cumbersome, too restrictive? I, no, I think that narrative is pretty easily falsified uh, in the United States as well as some other countries, um, definitely as a one-way ratchet. I mean, if we want to talk about pure monotonicity, um, you know, taken take into account first that um, the degree to which we see price regulation um, which was exactly what the Chicago School and, and other capture uh, theorists were so concerned about uh, so long ago. Uh, we've seen um, a, a whole range of areas where the government regulates prices uh, far less, I mean, governments, I should say, regulate prices far less. Um, we see far less regulation of antitrust m and uh, than we used to. Um, I actually think that's a problem. And I'm happy to say, I think that uh, I think the case against price regulation, especially micro level regulation of prices um, is, is generally a strong one, uh, the case against price regulation. Um, 
Uh, we've seen uh, a fair degree of deregulation in environmental uh, spaces. Um, and I would argue, depending on which part of the FDA you want to look at, uh, even in medicines approval and things like that, we've seen some deregulation. Um, this is state and local level, right? If you look at, say, freedom to build, many more cities are putting restrictions on building than are liberalizing. And you might expect over time the entire southeast will become a bit like, say, the California cities or Cambridge, Mass., for that matter, where they just don't want that much new to be built. Isn't that a one-way street, yeah. in essence? So I, I think I think this gets to some of the differences between an economist and a political scientist. I, I see what you're talking about as a kind of regulation, although to me, um, I see it much more as kind of housing policy. Um, and I think there are folks who say, well, let's try to construct a unified theory that puts you know, uh, uh, the EPA installing smokestack scrubbers, uh, mergers and acquisitions regulation, zoning regulations, because it's called a regulation, um, and say some set of price constraints and puts them into a unified theory. I think it, it's it, the, the point that you're talking to right now, whether it's kind of, I, I think there's a development in uh, local level valuation of housing in American culture um, that is leading many governments, I agree, to uh, crack down on, on building. Uh, it you know, happens in my own town uh, to make uh, building new construction harder. Um, and I could see that as ratcheting one way, except, of course, now let's talk about some of those very rural areas uh, that we just mentioned a few minutes ago that are depopulating. Um, it would be interesting. I don't know the answer to this question to see whether uh, there's more freedom to build in areas like that. My guess is where you're going to see uh, less freedom to build, if you want to use that metaphor, um, is in precisely the kinds of places uh, on the coasts and maybe in certain aspects of the Southeast, um, uh, places that are uh, driven in part by racial and ethnic discrimination, but also by wealth discrimination, uh, that are going to crack down uh, much more heavily upon uh, uh, you know, new building, especially new residential building. Which are the most and least captured federal agencies in the technical use of that term? Oh, good question. So I don't, I don't have a rank ordering for you um, from which I can draw the top and the bottom. Um, I think knowing some people who've been involved in the space um, and hearing, seeing also what's gone on worldwide, I would say one agency that has been captured uh, or, or plausibly captured um, would be the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And I think there's a complicated story there. Um, uh, the story in France uh, where they also have you know, nuclear regulation is that so many of the folks who work at that agency um, come through the, age, uh, the country's formidable technical schools and they're trained in a certain kind of way that leads them to be um, uh, much more likely to see nuclear regulate or nuclear power as a good thing. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, I happen to be a, a believer in nuclear power um, uh, as part of a bundle of uh, non-carbon based uh, uh, energy sources. That said, I think it's very plausible that due to kind of professional training, things like that, uh, nuclear regulation uh, uh, may be a plausible case of capture, both here and again um, in other countries. And who has captured it in the US? I think it would be some of the very power companies and uh, you know uh, interests there. Again, th there are the argument. Isn't that the case where the state and local governments are so restrictive, right? You cannot really get a new nuclear power plant built today. That that limits the supply. That's the one-way street we were talking about earlier, and it's just harder and harder to access what seems to be a pretty good solution for a lot of climate change problems. Uh, I think that's right, um, uh, but let's let's keep in mind that that restriction of supply, uh, you know, raises the price in some equilibrium sense for those who supply nuclear power. Uh, 
Um, and so it's not that I think, I think you're right that it's, it's state and local governments. It's a certain degree of, of you know, nimbyism on, on nuclear power plants. Um, uh, but I would also suggest that uh, there are, um, uh, it, it, it's not like you have a really robust coalition uh, pushing for stronger or, or shall I say, uh, more laissez-faire attitudes on um, more laissez-faire attitudes on whether to build more nuclear power plants or not. Let me just flip it by one. I, I would say for the moment, um, probably the least captured agency, and I wouldn't say the least, a, a, an agency that is newer uh, and less captured would probably be the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. That's not to say that I believe in every decision it makes. Um, I do think there's something to the way an agency gets set up that when it's new, um, uh, it's assuming it's set up in a, a certain way, it's got certain kind of uh, staffers, it's got merit service protection, things like that, um, that it is less likely to be captured. And this is at some level a, a difference between the early political science theories of capture and the Stiglerian theory. Stigler, I'm about to participate in a 50th anniversary. Um, uh, it's another podcast with Luigi Zingales on the 50th anniversary of Stigler's theory of economic regulation. His theory was really much more about legislative design um, and in much of the ways that you and I have been talking about. But before him, there were two political scientists who were um, thinking in similar but not identical terms. One was my late colleague, Sam Huntington, who actually wrote in the ICC, and the, the other was Marver Bernstein. And Marver Bernstein, who was at one point Dean of the Woodrow Wilson School, he talked about the life cycle of agencies. Um, and so capture wasn't something that was designed kind of you know, de novo uh, into an agency. It was something that evolved in an agency that wasn't originally captured, but became so. Um, I'm not saying that's a better model necessarily, but clearly sometimes that happens when capture by design does not. If your least captured agency is a very new agency, doesn't that make you out to be a lot more sympathetic to the capture theory than your published work might make it sound? Well, you have to remember uh, my published work in, uh, in um, uh, the, the book with David Moss suggests that, uh, you know, capture, the problem with capture is it's too sexy a term. Um, you know, David and I wrote during the midst of the financial crisis, when every time somebody didn't like the decision of a regulatory agency, uh, a pundit, an academic, uh, the, the term capture would be thrown around. Um, and you can think that an agency is uh, doing a, a good job, a bad job, efficient, non-efficient, and capture can be potentially orthogonal to that. That's the first thing I would say. The second, and we really got hit, um, I'd arguably say more from the left than from the right on this, is we actually, we actually argued it's kind of hard to prove capture. Um, you know, you have to have a, a counterfactual of what an agency that wouldn't be captured would in the same situation Ceteris Paribus be doing. And a lot of the existing empirical studies, and this goes back, you know, generations, and I'm, I'm indicting a set of things in political science as well as economics, suffer from the usual omitted variable bias problems. Um, and some of them, I think, were making the wrong inferences from uh, from the evidence that exists, such as, um, you know, noticing, for instance, that in certain kinds of patterns of regulatory decision making, larger and older firms uh, did better, um, uh, enjoyed, say, quicker or more favorable decisions than did smaller and newer firms. And as I, you know, wrote in a uh, it was a mathematical essay published almost 20, 20 years ago. That can be true even when uh, the underlying regulator or the regulator in question has zero implicit or explicit preference over the kind of firm it's regulating. It, uh, it has everything to do with kind of um, uh, not even risk avoidance, but uncertainty avoidance. How can we improve the process for public comments on regulations or pending regulations? This is something I'm actually working on a bit right now. Um, 
Uh, let me say two things. Um, the first is uh, uh, there's a, a paper that uh, your audience should check out by uh, my student, Brian Liebgaber. He's a collaborator of mine too. And what he did, uh, and ex excuse the digression, but I think it's a very important paper. So if you look at the Volcker rule, for instance, um, uh, it was a multi-agency rule issued under Dodd-Frank. Um, long before the comments rolled in, there were a set of hundreds of meetings with the agency that happened even before the notice of proposed rulemaking. And essentially the architecture that we have in the Administrative Procedures Act doesn't regulate those meetings at all. And a legal scholar named Kimberly Kraviak, I believe she's at Duke or she was when she wrote the article, Notice that the vast majority of these meetings, and I, I just go to the article, but I'm going to say 90% were with either large bank holding companies. So not, you know, the smaller regional banks, fifth, third, things like that. We're talking, you know, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, City, um, law firms representing those companies like Sullivan Cromwell, uh, and um, uh, associations representing those companies. And get into a whole question about why the hybrid representation uh, in, in another, but, but that was one, one thing is so, so pre, pre rulemaking, pre proposed rulemaking, earliest agenda setting meetings are dominated by industrial interests. The second, um, and this was a, an asset pricing study by uh, 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 Professor Liebgober, who's now at UCSD, showed that the banks that met, um, uh, though, uh, with the Fed, and he only looked at the Fed. Um, and then he used a very small window for when the proposed rules were announced. Um, and they uh, witnessed and enjoyed a um, statistically significant and uh, uh, financially significant uh, continual uh, uh, abnormal positive return on their stocks um, the moment the, the proposed rule was announced. Not so much the final rule, because that comes much later, but the, the first... The, the, and he totaled up, I think, 40 to $70 billion of positive abnormal returns just from those meetings with the Fed, just in the first hour, which is what an intraday study has to do uh, after the uh, proposed rule was announced. So you're telling through... me this is good, yes? I'm not so sure. I mean, yes and no. Recapitalizing banks, it's making them more valuable? It means the trading isn't all that risky. Well, now, so let's go back to your original question, though, Tyler, because your original question was about procedure. And to me, um, I guess I'd like to see open access. Um, so I'm not saying, let, I'm not by any means saying, hey, we need to get rid of these meetings. I do think we need to embed consumer and non-industry uh, perspectives more. And what that might mean is inducing rule writers to more regularly meet with advisory committees, uh, consumer, labor, other groups, uh, folks like the, the group at Better Markets, uh, you know, Americans for Financial Reform, uh, things like that. I'm not saying I agree with all of these folks, but I do think that right now, all of our attention on notice and comment rulemaking, and for that matter, cost benefit analysis as concomitant to it, misses the fact that there are people who are close observers of this space and now a very empirically sophisticated observer in this in this space, Brian Liebgaber, who believe that most of the action is actually occurring before notice and comment starts. If we take, say, nuclear power regulation, do you think that giving all these groups you mentioned a bigger role in nuclear power regulation would improve the outcome or make it worse? It seems to me it would make it worse. Well, why do you think that? Citizens groups mostly don't want nuclear power. Homeowners organize, try to build a nuclear power plant in Fairfax County. You have zero chance. So I, so I don't know. Look, I mean, you know, asking whether I know uh, how folks would, um, uh, w whether the policy would be better or worse is is a is a tougher call. But here, it might operate in some um, unpredictable ways. Uh, so nuclear power regulation, um, you might get, um, you know, uh, Steven Pinker like voices. He's a person who, you know, what Harvard scholar who wrote, um, uh, a, a kind of a pro nuclear power op-ed in the New York times recently, you might get some other voices at the table, uh, less, uh, voices, less organized, um, particularly if you embedded them in and there's some, there's a great chapter in our book, uh, Pre Preventing Regulatory Capture, 
by Daniel Schwartz, who's shown that at least an insurance regulation in Minnesota, um, that Minnesota has been able to do this, whether it's made folks better off or worse off, that's much harder to tell. Um, but uh, I would argue, in fact, that if you proactively embed uh, voices, interests uh, that wouldn't otherwise be represented, um, uh, that you'll actually open up the conversation. My guess, if I had to, if I had to think, would be the folks in Fairfax County, the, uh, the, the NIMBY folks, the anti-nuclear power folks, they're already pretty well represented in this process. Is the impact of FOIA laws overrated or underrated? <laughs> Depending on how enforced, I would say underrated. Um, they have had one. They have had one cost, um, which is it used to be the case. I don't want to say it's a cost, but they've changed an equilibrium in one sense, which is that um, it used to be the case that kind of uh, reporters had to cultivate a relationship with an agency insider, uh, a bureaucrat, in order to get information out of that person. Um, and what that led to sometimes was, of course, well, we didn't see as much, but it also meant that the uh, reporter became better informed about what was going on in the agency. Um, and there are stories you can tell, you know, reporters and mid-level agency folks who would talk on a semi-regular basis for years. Now, um, they kind of don't need to have that relationship to get the information they want. And so they just file a FOIA request and they get it. Now that said, and again, going from the experience of the last few years, um, going from what I regard as a, a critical worry uh, for our globe, for our country, kind of creeping authoritarianism, I think uh, uh, FOIA is, uh, and strongly enforced because it was just weakened by the Supreme Court, uh, is one of the most important uh, laws that we have. In the area of regulation, the impact of ethics laws, overrated or underrated? Uh, just clarification, what do you mean by ethics laws, like uh, revolving door? That would be one example, but restrictions on people who work, say, in federal agencies. I get, sorry, you just can't ju If you work uh, at a financial regulator, you can't just let the people at Goldman Sachs take you out for a fancy dinner, right? That's an ethics law. We have lots of them. I see, yeah. So I, I'm going to say, again, it would be easy for me to say underrated or overrated. I'm going to say, uh, you know, it really does depend. Um, I The revolving door uh, constraints um, might be overrated. I think uh, I, I worry a little bit less about people moving back and forth than than, than others do. Um, it turns out there's some evidence that that uh, that banks and other agencies, or excuse me, other firms, companies that want uh, talent are most likely to get uh, the regulators who are toughest uh, earlier on. And so I'm not sure it leads to the usual kinds of stories. Um, in terms of small favors, uh, let me say that I think that's underrated. I think the, the psychological literature uh, uh, has demonstrated that small gifts are sometimes the most powerful ones. Okay, now the FDA. You've written yourself that the main function of the FDA is often about information rather than safety. If that's the case, why don't we have what my colleague Robin Hansen called the banned product store? That is, the FDA would announce what it has approved, but uh, say treatments or drugs or vaccines that had not approved, within reason, would be available for purchase. You just would know you were taking your chances. Why not do that? Have the FDA provide the information only. Um, yeah, I think uh, I would say two things. Uh, number one, um, uh, it, it's a it's a brute mechanism, but uh, the mechanism of uh, what I would call approval regulation, uh, which is basically the FDA as a veto player granting access to profitable markets, creates very very powerful incentives for R and D. Um, and those are incentives that we would otherwise not have. My worry is that in the uh, Robin Hansen case, uh, and by the way, I haven't read this particular case, but I've seen some, you know, FDA is good house housekeeping seal of right. approval. Um, we basically, you know, uh, you know there, there are different ways of generating information. We want the good stuff. We want the RCTs. We want credible information. I'm, I'm happy to talk about Bayesian clinical trials, so-called real world evidence. That's a term that's thrown around a little too much without definition. Um, but, you know, 
if we're thinking about ways that, um, say, a pharmaceutical company can inform its potential consumers, and I mean consumers at all levels, so payers, physicians, nurse practitioners, pharmacies, uh, you know, folks who uh, decide on formularies, and then relevant to, to vaccination, the people who get the shots in their arms or whether or not they adhere to the drug. Um, well, they can, they, they've got other ways to do that, and that's advertising. Um, and so you could have a world in which, um, uh, you know, it's kind of like a lemons equilibrium uh, in which uh, essentially you would have uh, lots of uh, bad products out competing good ones. For what it's worth, in why the would they out compete century- the good ones? So the UK approved the Pfizer vaccine, the US hadn't approved it yet. I would have the option of going to a special store and trying it. Right, we would have saved thousands of lives. Well, that's but that's but that's that's kind of a partial equilibrium story. I'm talking about a world where these institutions didn't exist, where where neither the UK nor the US had uh, anything like the FDA, anything no, we, like we an have approval an FDA, regime. but it issues judgments that are like a good housekeeping seal of approval. Oh, yeah, but then there's no then there's no incentive uh, or very weak incentives for anybody to do randomized clinical trials, which I would argue is one of the most important scientific revolutions of the 20th century. You want to get the seal of approval, right? That's one reason to do a trial. Why, but, but why if you don't if, if you can just go and sell it offline and, and then advertise your way into the marketplace? This is exactly the way the patent medicine industry worked. Well, look at Tesla, all the R&D they've done to create a better version of their car, which they sell for a higher price. Let let me ask you a different question. But but I think, let me just stop you there, because I think there's an important difference. And I think, you know, you're an economist. I'm not professionally trained. My wife is, spent a lot of time around economists. I think the biggest difference here is, is that, you know, cars are experience goods, uh, maybe even inspection goods, and drugs are credence goods. We can't really know whether or not, even if we were cured, whether the drug was the cause. Um, and that gets into a lot, and I've, I've written about these kinds of issues in, in, in other things. Um, and so uh, I, I don't usually buy the model of um, uh, you know, cars or other kinds of experience goods uh, uh, as mapped onto drugs, because I think the information structure of those markets is quite different. Um, and I think that uh, the role of beliefs is, is far, far more important uh, collective beliefs, if you will, Bayesian priors uh, uh, about uh, whether or not such things work is, is ab- absolutely central and, and deeply endogenous to the, to, the, to the value of the product itself. A doctor today can attempt a new method of surgery without getting FDA approval, right? Should we change that? Um, and it seems yes. to work fine, right? Well, and there's plenty you know, of RCTs for surgery. Yes, although keep in mind that if the doctor uh, rolls out uh, a new medical device, um, uh, which is uh, leads to a lot of surgical innovation, that device has to be approved by the FDA. Um, there are, of course, you know, other kinds of bodies, and it's not just the tort system, uh, but uh, you know, medical professional societies, things like that, that. Um, uh, uh, regulate that space very well. Um, uh, I say when I say very well, very strongly. I'm not saying that's an optimum policy, um, but if anything, uh, I'd say far more than in the case of uh, drugs. In the case of surgery, it's the tort system that regulates that. And uh, well, pick your poison. I'm not sure the tort system is. I mean, you could say that's a system that works well. Really? I mean, do we know that, uh, you know, surgical innovation has provided that much more in terms of health benefits than pharmaceutical innovation? I haven't seen the aggregate accounting. Um, but if it has, uh, the, the form of regulation there is deeply decentralized, subject to all forms of bias. And that's, and that's juries. It's at the state and local level, not the federal level, right? Take off-label prescriptions for drugs, right? Which are a highly significant phenomenon, as you know. Right. Uh, that's not subject to FDA approval. Uh, should we change that? In essence, a lot, a significant percentage of total drug usage is not regulated directly by the FDA yeah, for so, the purposes it's being used for. Right. Right. Excellent. No, good. Good question. Um, you know, I've thought about this uh, a little bit. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of room for flexibility in the current system. And one of the things that I try to say, I'm not, you know, I'm happy to criticize uh, the FDA on any number of things. Um, and I'm sure we'll get a chance uh, in what time we have today. 
But um, there's actually been a fair degree of flexibility. Maybe it's come slower uh, than you might uh, hope for in cancer. But cancer is kind of, you know, sui generis in many respects. Um, adherence rates are very high because a lot of the drugs are given just directly in the clinic. Um, uh, it's a community of researchers that uh, uh, is, it's essentially highly closed. I mean, there are some, you know, doctors here and there who do do things, but um, uh, you know, uh, it governed immensely by ASCO. Um, uh, uh, there's a there's a kind of a community of practice there, and so what the FDA does in a lot of these cases is allows for uh, a molecule to be um, uh, approved. Uh, say cisplatin would be an example of the first uh, platinum-based chemotherapy. And then basically knows, uh, I think the FDA knows that when a lot of these molecules are out there, there's gonna be off-label prescribing. That's not to say, however, that off-label prescribing is not regulated. Um, whether something is on the label or not uh, is still a significant decision. Um, and I've written about the case of bevacizumab uh, for breast cancer. Um, and that was a pretty significant decision by the FDA um, and one that uh, uh, a number of industrial interests fought against pretty hard, in part because they knew that money was on the line. If we think about testing for COVID-19, you know, starting maybe with Paul Romer and Glenn Weil, who, who have been on this podcast, Michael Mina, a variety of commentators, Alex Tabarrok, now Ezra Klein, all have believed, and in some cases shown using measurements, mathematics, statistics, that if much earlier COVID-19 testing had been available, although imperfect, that the United States would have been much better off. And the FDA only now this week in uh, the end of March is allowing such testing. Doesn't that verify the old style Sam Peltzman argument that the FDA is too risk averse, too slow? And when the FDA finally did let some of that testing through, you had to do it with a prescription, which seems makes no sense under any worldview. Yeah. Right. So was Sam Peltzman right about the FDA? No. So, so let me just say, I agree with the criticism of the FDA on testing. Um, and I pretty sure I mentioned this to a reporter, you know, back in the spring, I don't know whether they ever, I, I, I've said this to a number of folks um, for what it's worth. Again, keep in mind that that's actually not the same division that approves drugs, which by the way, is not the same division that Sam Peltzman critiqued. Um, so I don't think it verifies Sam Peltzman and it's not clear to me um, but the general about, view that the FDA is too slow, right? Whether yeah, but, it's Peltzman but or not. no, I, 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 I hear you. But, but actually Peltzman, for what it's worth, the original article was more about sort of number of new chemical entity introductions. And it was really much more about the regulation of the research process. And people like to say, well, is it FDA too slow, FDA too fast? A lot of that just came from Congress, from legislation. Um, uh, including the 1962 Kefauver uh, Harris uh, drug amendments. But, you know, in this case, I think there's a very plausible case. In the case of testing, yes, I think there's a very plausible case that the FDA was too slow. Um, exactly what the uh, public health, uh, you know, did, did that cause um, more deaths than, say, uh, you know, a culture that didn't take uh, COVID seriously? Um, uh, 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 people not believing COVID was a problem, uh, vaccine hesitancy in the United States, which I think is pretty significant. Um, you know, that's much harder for me to, uh, or I think for anybody to, to, to judge what the marginal contribution, but I have no problem in saying that, yes, I think that that was a, an issue, but look, we can always find a, a single example of where an agency was too slow or too conservative, or, and I think this is the other way, stuck to its scientific procedures too much without adaptability, um, which I think is one of the cases, uh, one of the problems with the FDA and testing. Um, and not think about all the other cases in which, uh, no, the FDA was right to, uh, you know, uh, abide by a certain procedural conservatism. But shouldn't there be a button within the FDA that can be pushed where the FDA goes into a kind of wartime mode? Let me give you another example. The AstraZeneca vaccine was approved by over 15 nations, including Canada and the United Kingdom. FDA still has done nothing. You might think now, much later, well, only approve it for men who are over 50 due to some data on thrombosis. But basically, it seems many responsible countries approved AstraZeneca 
FDA did nothing. Had we had that vaccine earlier, it would have saved thousands of lives. FDA didn't seem to care. Why isn't that an example? Again, if the FDA um, being too slow and too conservative. So I, I actually think the AstraZeneca vaccine um, uh, is more complicated than the story that you're um, saying. So in part, it's what uh, you know, Dr. Fauci, uh, now our national healthcare celebrity, but de deservedly so, called an unforced error. Um, so you should check out the Karen Landman uh, op-ed at the Times back on March 23rd. Um, as she shows that AstraZeneca has had managerial issues all along with production, with testing, early problems in data reporting, uh, manufacturing problems in uh, Belgium. Um, then there were study design and data reporting issues that were called uh, by the company's own DSMB, the data, Sci uh, data Safety Monitoring Board. So there are a whole bunch of folks, you could say, oh, well, there's a whole bunch of folks who've, who've um, uh, approved it. Of course, as we know, in many cases in Europe, there are people who don't want to take it in part because of its bad reputation. So to me, but that I comes think, from the regulators itself, right? Macron. I bad don't. I disagree with that. I disagree with Merkel. That. Bad I, I disagree with that strongly, Tyler. Yeah, I disagree with that strongly. Back and forth on who should take it below no, sixty, above sixty. No, again, AstraZeneca has had credibility issues all along. So the idea that vaccine hesitancy is just some regulatory construct or some byproduct, uh, I think, is number one demonstrably false. And number two, I think it misses the big problem that corporate reputation matters. And AstraZeneca, you, you could, you, we could, I could grant that, yeah, maybe we should, you know, roll AstraZeneca out there. About the thousands of lives counterfactual, I'm going to disagree because um, it's not clear to me. And you might see this problem with Johnson and Johnson. I, I cl clearly see it in a lot of conversations. Uh, it'd be interesting to see survey data about whether people trust certain brands more than others. Um, and, uh, you know, part of it is vaccine nationalism. Uh, you know, the French don't trust the British. Uh, the British trust uh, what's uh, endorsed by their uh, uh, National Health Service, but also their own company, uh, far more, uh, things like that. Look, it's the same AstraZeneca company. So the British saved many thousands of lives by being prompt with AstraZeneca. Surely we don't think that is a mistake. We've had a supply constraint on the vaccine side in the United States, maybe up until now. Uh, we could have done the same had we approved AstraZeneca. So the company made big mistakes, but why penalize the people who can get the vaccine for that when, again, you could save thousands of lives? I just don't get it. I, I just, to me, actually, I'm not sure that the AstraZeneca vaccine would have been taken uh, in the United States. Um, uh, so you referenced the Ezra Klein story, um, and I gave a talk uh, recently to um, uh, a group in Israel and Europe on regulation where I said the big bullet we dodged in the past year um, was one in which there was all this pressure in summer 2020 on the FDA uh, to quicken a whole uh, set of uh, uh, therapies for uh, uh, um, coronavirus and COVID-19. Um, and this obviously started with hydroxychloroquine, which we, I think I think the jury is in on that now, not effective. Uh, convalescent plasma, probably very effective, um, but its rollout certainly didn't help. And um, what you see in at least two different surveys over the summer of 2020, um, is a pronounced drop in expressed willingness to be vaccinated, um, anywhere from 10 to 15 percentage points, and deeply concentrated among the young. And the mathematical models would suggest that's exactly the population you want to have vaccinated sooner or later. Why? They're more mobile. They're much more likely to be vectors. Um, so I've done some back of the envelope calculations. I shared them with Ezra. Um, I've also presented them uh, to this group. Um, and if you just, you know, if we start to think about what's the social value uh, of, you know, good vaccination just for the United States, right? And we think anywhere in the area of 10 to 20 trillion. Um, I know some economists who think it's much higher. But now we think, okay, what if the vaccine, because you could talk about, you could have said this with vaccine, just about any vaccine. Um, you know, Pfizer, Pfizer's readout from its data wasn't until November, but you could have said, well, why, why didn't we approve that vaccine in May or June? Um, and you would have had, I think, a social catastrophe, uh, you know, tens of millions of people not taking the vaccine, uh, 
Uh, it's con very consistent with those polls that, that right after the convalescent plasma debacle showed a 10 to 15 percentage point decline uh, in uh, and, and possibly greater in uh, 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 vaccine uh, confidence. Um, and you would have lost thousands and thousands of lives that way. Um, so if at we the end at of the actual... day, vaccines are only as good, especially a treatment with positive externalities. Vaccines are only as good as the set of population that takes them. And again, I, I emphasize it's the young that you need for her herd immunity. The marginal benefit of vac vaccinating the young is higher for her herd immunity. If we look at actual behavior, if you take the United Kingdom, which was the first to approve Pfizer, was quick with AstraZeneca, has a government that in some ways has a reputation for being reckless, right? They have arguably weaker approval procedures than the FDA. They've been one of the countries with the least vaccine hesitancy. They got vaccines out there. The results already are shown to be good. More people want the vaccine. They see that their uncle is not keeling over dead. Why isn't that a better theory of public opinion, that if you get people good vaccines quickly, that make them healthier, more people are going to want vaccines? So so two things. Number one, I think that the UK is, again, kind of sui generis. Um, in part, they, they trust uh, their own company and they trust uh, their national health service. Um, they've got a very good uh, sort of public system, which if we recreate it in the United States would really dramatically transform that. Um, look, the correlation between uh, vaccine hesitancy factors as expressed in public opinion and vaccine uh, vaccination, first dose vaccination of eligible population in the United States is 0.6. That's an extremely high correlation. So, you know, rather than just use a story, let's actually look at data. And the data suggests, in fact, that public opinion uh, on vaccine confidence is a very, very strong predictor of actual vaccinations in the United States. The other example I would say is, you know, let, part, of, part of my theory of the FDA is let, let's divorce it to some degree from vaccination more generally. Let's look more broadly at what happens. It, it's not that just that people said last summer, oh gosh, we don't trust Trump. It's we, that we don't trust certain kinds of procedural irregularities that are going on uh, at the FDA, which of course are very deeply Trump related. But I'll give you another example. It's a completely different example in a different world, but I think it's important. It's a tragic story. Um, uh, there's this uh, deadly disease, Duchenne's multiple dystrophy, um, for which was uh, developed a really important drug uh, called uh, etiplersin or uh, uh, exondus. Um, and it was uh, approved under a uh, very, um, and I say it's an important drug, it's an important drug therapy. It's actually still not known uh, whether it works in many respects. Um, but the FDA approval procedure was, um, shall we say, uh, different and marked by much more controversy than usual. The advisory committee voted against it. Uh, the division director voted against it. Janet Woodcock, senior director, voted for it. Uh, I believe it was then uh, Commissioner Robert Califf who uh, approved it um, over and above uh, uh, the uh, other objections. And that's fine. He had his right to do that. But it was clear from everybody watching uh, that uh, this was not the usual approval process. So you say, no, oh, what's the problem? Like now we've got this, you know, drug for, you know, a deadly disease that's on the market. Well, the problem is lots of insurers now won't cover it, still won't. And the New York Times ran a story about this and they got one exec to say, um, and I'm paraphrasing, you can look up the story. Um, but I know that I just looked up a whole bunch of Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, groups still won't cover uh, Exondus. Um, uh, they, they basically said, we don't know whether this works. And these are not folks, this is not vaccine hesitancy where you've got all the kind of standard psycho cycle. These are informed purchasers, right? Um, and so part of what happens when you have procedural irregularity or, or, or uh, you know, corners cut or bad evidence underlying uh, approval decisions um, is you get, in some cases, what might be rational hesitancy on the part of treatments. Um, I think we can say right now, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, hey, look, we've got these great mRNA vaccines, we've got some other vaccines out there. Um, uh, you know, uh, sure, if we had done things differently, that's right. But of course, that's not what I would regard as a 
proper rational and Bayesian way to think about it. Um, the question is what decisions should we have made at the time given the information we had? Um, uh, you might be saying, well, I want a value function that places heavy, heavy emphasis on the option value, that things could just go right here. Um, I'm very much open to that. But what I want also is a world where the unknown, deeply unknown product studied uh, or uh, being potentially approved gets studied massively, thoroughly, uh, and where the studies continue well after approval. And that's, by the way, something else that you miss with the good housekeeping model. Um, you don't have any incentive for sort of continual study of things that are sometimes, say, like something like Prozac or a statin, are taken for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years of a person's life. Now, you can often get better data when you do a human challenge trial, right? So do you favor those? Should the federal government have started those in, say, May? Yeah, I can, I can see an argument for that. I don't have any, yeah, I, um, uh, a, a challenge trial, um, I'll just, yeah, I, I think that's fine. Yeah, I, that I, seems I, like a huge gain, right? It's not a small thing. Hardly any public health people came out for them. Derek Lowe said he wasn't on board, would have saved hundreds of thousands of lives. If our public health establishment- oh, I'm, I'm not sure about that causal estimate. <laughs> well, say the vaccines would have been ready by October, right? The whole winter wave, we would have had significant protection against. And yeah, again, I, 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 so again, I'm, I'm going to put out this. a different counterfactual, Tyler. I, I, I wonder again, and a part of this is inseparable from the fact that we just had, you know, a really, really divisive election. Um, but I actually think uh, one big feature of the uh, uh, of the uh, that th increased confidence in the vaccines is that uh, they were approved after the election. I'm not saying they should have been, but I'm saying if you would have rushed things out in September and October, which was precisely when vaccine confidence was at its nadir, it was actually much higher during the summer uh, beforehand, um, but it had sunk again, 10 to 15 percentage points, you would have had, you would have had a vaccine that, that tens of millions of people were not taking. How should we improve our system of drug labels? Does anyone read them? Do they give real information? Actually, you know, I, I, so there's an argument. So that I think one of the findings out there is that is that uh, black box labeling um, definitely uh, changes behavior, sometimes for the worse. Um, so there's an argument out there that when you added uh, suicidality to SSRIs, uh, that um, one of the uh, uh, results was is that people were, uh, psychiatrists and primary care physicians were prescribing them less commonly to uh, uh, teenagers, uh, adolescents, and others, um, and that uh, we had increased suicides as a result. Um, and so I think we need to think very carefully about, um, uh, th there ought to be, to call it a cost-benefit analysis, I think is, 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 both right and wrong. I think there needs to be a prospective consideration of what the costs are of putting the health costs of putting something on a black label, uh, black box label um, that would do it. The other thing I would say is, you know, the usual argument is that what, you know, doctors only what 50 to 60% of the time read the label. Um, there are some people who say, well, then the label beyond the black box really isn't effective. I, I actually agree. It's not that I'm generally a glass half full guy. Um, I just happen to think that actually 50 to 60% of people reading the actual label is, is actually something that we should be pleasantly surprised about. Should we allow for placebo prescriptions for depression, for back pain? It seems they might well, work. Kind of we, 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 we do already, already in a sense, right? Yeah, we, we kind of already do. Uh, I mean, vitamin D was that way for a long time, right? Um, and so, uh, and so that's, that's, you know, one of the, you know, one of the things And again, you know, that there's where we get into a different kind of form of regulator. Uh, it's, it, you know, in part it's the FDA, but in part it's state medical societies and practice boards. If, if major pharmaceutical companies want to run drug trials in poor countries, often it's Africa, but it could be Latin America, other parts of the world outside of the scrutiny of U.S. regulators. Should we allow that? Should we encourage it? Should we stop it? Um, I think it should be allowed, but I also think that the FDA is, uh, um, uh, or any other regulator, say it's Britain's regulator, uh, which by the way, I don't think is that, cons is that uh, laissez-faire. I think, uh, you know, compared to um, 
you know, Europe, if, if, if anything, European ph uh, pharmaceutical regulation from which Britain has just only recently broken uh, has long been at least as procedurally conservative as the U US, say since the 1990s. Um, I, I think it's uh, entirely fine for some of these wealthier countries to say, well, we don't trust those trials and we're not going to um, rely upon those trials alone uh, in say a pivotal phase three or a really important phase two trial. Um, you get into problems with, uh, you know, what's the quality of a country's institutions? And this is something we usually think about from the standpoint of say somebody like, you know, Robert Putnam or Douglas North or Margaret Levy. Um, but I think institutions and the credibility of scientific institutions is also important. Um, uh, back when I wrote the book on the FDA, I spent a little bit of time in India and thinking about its issues uh, in regulating drugs. And of course, there's a lot of drug manufacturing in India, a lot of generics manufacturing and so forth. Um, I don't know the stats offhand, but you know, the FDA has any number of times had to crack down on uh, generic drug manufacturers uh, in India. Um, there have been a whole host of quality problems there. Um, so uh, if we think that a country has weak scientific and, and kind of you know, credibility-based institutions, um, then I'm fine with allowing the trials there, but I'm uh, also fine with uh, regulators in uh, advanced, so-called advanced industrial countries saying, yeah, we're not going to allow those trials or we're not going to accept those trials as pivotal for approval. Okay, we now get to your new book. Again, I'll repeat the title, Democracy by Petition, Popular Politics and Transformation, 1790 to 1870. It helped me think about a whole host of issues anew. First question, how and why were petitions key to the women's rights movement in the 19th century? Well, I think really a uh, uh, great question. Um, and uh, so I think if you think about the international women's rights movement, not just the United States, but also New Zealand, Australia, Canada, even France, uh, uh, Britain, um, in part, women saw themselves signing these petitions, not just individually, but collectively. Um, they saw the weight of numbers and they saw that, um, especially white women, uh, as they learned actually, um, at some level, uh, Native American women in the United States were petitioning in ways that were more innovative, uh, even compared to white women. But as they saw this, what I call the countability of voice, the idea that um, uh, their, their voices could matter not only in the arguments they put, put forth, but also in the weight of the numbers, um, I think that became a much more powerful uh, motivator for women's rights movements to make bolder and bolder claims for the vote. Why was early 19th century French Canada so important for the history of petitions? This is the hardcore podcast in case you hadn't known. No, I, and, and by the way, your, 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 your questions have been challenging and thought provoking uh, all along. Uh, this has been great. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think actually, you know, we tend to think, oh, you know, what are the big petitioning societies, um, you know, the United States, Britain, um, Anglo-American societies, and in part, uh, French Canada is that because it's still technically a colony. Um, but I would say two things happened. At some level, it was kind of um, a Jacksonian revolution before Jackson, uh, 1822 and even 1827 and 1828 before Jackson was president you get um, what would be called kind of a producer's revolution in favor of parliamentary responsibility and parliamentary sovereignty. And at some level you could say, well, weren't they just doing what had already happened in the United States with uh, you know, the American Revolution? And I would say no. Um, and let me be clear, what I'm talking about here is arguably you know, the largest on a per capita basis petition of the Atlantic world of its time, uh, a single petition with over 90,000 names attached excuse me, 87,000 names, roughly 90,000 names attached that was signed in what is today Quebec. Um, and with which uh, 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 the French Canadians did several things. First off, they fought off colonial fusion. Um, if you ask yourself, you know, why does French Canada still French Canada and why is Canada bilingual? You kind of have to point to these petitioning campaigns 
as one of the reasons that uh, colonial fusion was, was fought off. The other thing that they did, which was not easy to do at the time, was to depose a colonial governor. Um, even in uh, you know, British North America, the, you know, the 13 colonies uh, that eventually became the United States, getting a colonial governor deposed was much easier through elite mechanisms, going through the colonial office, going to the crown, than by massive protests. And that's exa exactly what they did with uh, deposing Governor Dalhousie in the uh, United States. Finally, um, you know, as I mentioned, and there are other historians who um, have really, I think, cemented this story better than I have. Malcolm Chase, who's you know, arguably the historian of the Chartists. You know, working class reform in Britain depended heavily upon lessons that the Chartists and other working class uh, agitators in Britain learned from the French Canadians. Um, uh, they called them our brothers in oppression uh, in the 1830s. And a whole host of things that happen uh, as the suffrage is open, as a whole bunch of uh, changes happen in 19th century Britain, were taken with at least partial inspiration from French Canadians, the Patriot movement, as I described them, and these petitions. Now, let me ask you an analytical question, and please try to give me an answer for both the middle of the 19th century and then for today. So there's a, a bunch of different hypotheses you might have about petitions, that they strengthen the relative power of what is truly popular. Or you might think it strengthens the relative power of groups who organize well, or maybe groups who are good on the media, groups that are good at fundraising. On net, overall, on average, for each of those two periods, what do you analytically see as the major effect of petitions apart from any particular case? Yeah, uh, excellent question, Tyler. Um, I, so I think the 19th century is easier to answer because that's the, what I just wrote about. Um, what I see is um, uh, particularly during this crucial period, say the 1820s to the 1850s in the United States, Canada, parts of Mexico, people who didn't already have uh, organizations, didn't already have parties, which of course in the United States especially were um, uh, you know, really important technological innovation. Um, didn't already have lobbies, didn't already have interest groups, were able to successfully harness the petition to make uh, their voices better heard, to set the agenda. I think agenda setting is really important when we think about democratization and also to organize. I mean, what I you know, argue in the book is that everything from anti-slavery societies to new parties, such as Canadian reform parties, the American Whigs and others, um, drew much of their energy uh, and structure from early petitioning campaigns. Um, look, we're in a different world now, especially in the United States, where um, I don't think petitions have quite the um, uh, uh, societal and historical imprint that they used to. There's a whole bunch of reasons for that, but I want to answer your question. I would say now, um, in part, we, well, we don't have, let me just first bracket this by saying we don't have uh, you know, anything like the legislative petition process that we used to have in the 19th century. And by the way, Canada still does. And Canada still gets, I think, 1,500 paper petitions per year. Now, we could get into a whole argument about whether that changes anything. Um, I think what you're going to see with um, uh, petitioning nowadays, especially of the electronic variety, um, occasionally of the plebiscitary variety, like the initiative and referendum, is that um, uh, select, select groups and interests that know how to make something go viral. And, and viral, virality, if I can use that uh, term, was there in the 19th century now, but, but, but like you have to make it get hot right away. I'm reminded of that um, there was an electronic petition signed about 10 years ago contesting um, new card fees at Bank of America. I think it was by somebody in Chevy Chase. Uh, and I remember the story was in the, and, and immediately, like within days, hundreds of thousands of signatures, Bank of America backed down. Uh, I don't know, by the way, whether that's good or bad economic policy. Um, probably uh, an effective petition from the standpoint of having changed things. Um, and can you imagine any other institution, the courts, parties, through which that would have happened? Nowadays, we could say social media. Somebody could jump on the social media and say, hey, look at this awful card statement I just got. And then you get a bunch of likes. So it's some kind of aggregation mechanism like that that can do that. But I don't think 
we have um, the kinds of institutions that we used to in part because we don't have uh, a petition institution that structures robust public debate as much as we used to. And I think that's a problem. If I look at state level referenda, I tend to think it's a bad idea to make them too easy. California being exhibit A. Do you agree with that view or, or differ from it? And if you agree with it, doesn't it mean you now think petitions actually have become on that somewhat harmful? Yeah, um, so I do agree with that. Um, I teach a course at uh, Harvard called uh, Repub Res Publica, or it used to be called What is a Republic? Um, and um, and I argue that I think uh, it's problematic when uh, not just, say, a policy, but any uh, constitutional amendment, as has occurred in several states, uh, can occur with just 50 plus epsilon percentage of the vote of the people who happen to show up on a given day. And we know that some of these are, are, are you know, uh, uh, small turnout elections. So let me just say that's about initiative and referendum. I, I'm not going to you know, wax much more generally about, say, school financing or bond issuances, things like that. But at the level of California, yeah, I, I do have problems with those institutions, in part because it weakens the separation of powers. It weakens deliberation. Um, one advantage of representative government is that there are certain kinds of deliberation and investigation that go on. Um, it weakens compromise, right? It's, it's either we're going to have this uh, a ballot proposition, or we're going to have the status quo. Um, and nobody gets to go into the ballot and say, oh, let's think about a third option between the two that might be better than both. Um, the ballot um, and the plebiscite doesn't give you that option. Um, I distinguish, for that reason, between plebiscitary uh, petitions and what I call directed petitions. Um, I uh, also worry about plebiscitary petitions, um, and I don't think they have... Um, the same uh, value, institutional robustness, uh, and benefits that directed petitions, which are the kind of petitions that I write about in Democracy by Petition, do. And so, in part, the answer to the question is yes. I, I, you know, agree that I, I'm not that high on the initiative and referendum process. Ohio, by the way, if I can bracket, uh, has uh, you know a policy that might be a little better, which is to say, all right, we're going to let the legislature pass a law, so we're going to respect the Republican small R process, separated powers, things like that. We're going to allow the people to veto it, but then the agenda is then set by the Republican process, mixed regime, and so forth, not untrammeled, purely discretionary lawmaking power or constitutional amendment power, again, given to that 50 plus epsilon percentage points of people on a given day. Um, and then what I will just say again is, I think in part, you know, petitioning, I don't want to, I don't know if it's net harmful, it's definitely become um, uh, less beneficial, uh, in part because of the way that plebiscites uh, have transformed the petition. What would be an example of a reform you would like to see that would make current American government more democratic? At any level, well, let me let me extend. Um, let me let me extend part of the logic of my book uh, a, a bit. I actually think it wouldn't necessarily be such a bad idea um, if uh, legislatures were to reintroduce. I'm not saying this would be the top ranked reform, but I don't think it would be such a bad idea if legislatures at all level of government had to reintroduce petition days. Um, such as governed the United States until the 1950s uh, and many state legislatures. And what it would mean is that I, I think part of the problem that we're, you know, we, we've got institutions that are efficient at some level. Um, if we want to take a mass of, you know, millions, hundreds of millions of people and condense their preferences down into a single platform and a single label, parties do that well. The problem is, is that so much gets left out of the process to say nothing of the kinds of polarization that can end up really kind of breaking a society into two, um, which I do think we're in, in, at risk of in the United States, and of course, which has happened before. Um, and so it would basically be a way to make not just the United States more democratic, um, but actually to make the Democratic Republic uh, more deliberative. Um, which would be to, and it would be inefficient. I'll, I'll be honest, you know, and, and at some level you could say, well, yeah, wouldn't legislators, you know, be better off 
you know, reading, uh, you know, scholarship from economists and doctors and things like that and getting presentations from people in the know, you could argue, yeah, maybe they would. Um, but I actually think it would uh, uh, potentially increase social trust. And by the way, New Zealand and Canada do this now, right? Of course, you can always say, well, yeah, New Zealand and Canada do everything better. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Um, but, uh, you know, it's not unknown for this to occur uh, in, the modern, uh, in the modern day. And um, uh, so again, giving the, you know, the people the sense of being heard. And then I would say arguably potentially opening up the legislative agenda, because I think there's a degree to which, you know, the closure of agendas, which makes parties efficient, um, often present, prevents some of the best ideas from, you know, reaching uh, the table of policy. Last two questions. First, can you tell us a bit about your work with Native Americans and Indigenous peoples more generally? Yeah, so I grew up um, in a very small town in Michigan. Um, uh, my wife also grew up in a very small town. Uh, she actually grew up on a farm uh, right next to an Indian reservation, and we had uh, one near us as well. Um, I didn't think about it for a long time, but when I got digging into this petitions project, I spent a lot of time in the archives as I did uh, in the FDA book. Um, and as I began to look into the petitions, I just saw more and more petitions from Native Americans. Um, and that's part of the reason that I emphasize them as much as I do in the book is that on a per capita basis, you know, maybe the French Canadians aside, um, you know, few people are petitioning uh, as much as they are. Um, and then that got me into thinking also, you know, why, why don't political scientists study uh, Native Americans? I mean, there's, you know, uh, millions of them, uh, you know, especially you start to take a look at Alaska, First Nations, things like that. You've got all this variation in tribal government. So part of it was an intellectual interest. Um, and then without getting into uh, a long personal history, um, I'm not indigenous myself, but I've got a number of family members who are on different both sides. Um, in part, it was, uh, you know, hearing just different stories around um, uh, uh, dinner tables, family reunions, uh, things like that, that made me start to think that these are things that we should probably be uh, studying. The work I do now um, is in part uh, work on uh, Native history, uh, allowing these people to understand, not allowing them to understand, they understand it pretty well, um, uh, uh, working with them to better understand um, uh, their histories of petitioning, advocacy, things like that, um, lobbying. Um, and in some cases, uh, like one of the courses I'm teaching right now, um, part of what we do is work with particular tribal communities, uh, nations that are um, dealing with some pretty significant issues like, you know, uh, suicide uh, uh, and suicide prevention uh, at the Fort Peck Reservation um, or, um, uh, you know, food, traditional food gathering practices and the way they're regulated by state governments and the kind of maze that uh, different Native Americans have to navigate uh, as they, uh, you know, practice their traditional cultures. Last question. How and why do you enjoy fly fishing? <laughs> Thanks. Um, I think, uh, may maybe you'll disagree, but I think most of your ac academic visitors uh, would agree that sooner or later you need something uh, where when you do it, you can't think about work. Not that you just don't, but you almost can't because of the absorption into a task. Um, I disagree with those who say that fly fishing is some kind of Zen practice. I mean, I've spent enough time, you know, freezing on a, on a stream fishing for steelhead uh, uh, in the Great Lakes or the Pacific Northwest uh, or fumbling with my knots and things like that. Um, there, there are moments that are I don't even know what Zen is because I don't practice it, but there are moments that are definitely contemplative and lovely, but it's, it's absorbing. And, um, uh, and it's absorbing in um, some very few beautiful places. Um, I've got a brook trout right behind me in a picture. Uh, it's one that my students see in all my lectures. Um, I happen to think that brook trout are some of the most beautiful creatures on the planet. Um, ex uh, proof for the existence of a divine. Uh, and um, I like spending time around brook trout. Daniel Carpenter, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Tyler. It was an honor.